Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or shortened for IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association, IPA World. And you can find more information about IPA World at ipaworld.org. As part of our efforts to promote play, we've introduced these porch play chats, which are conversations with experts on a variety of topics who are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the latest porch play chats at ipausa.org. Up into that, up in that right um, corner of the website, you'll find access to our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page. One Porch Play Chat is released every Monday on both the IPA USA YouTube channel and our Facebook page so that you can be a friend on our Facebook page and always have the latest Porch Play Chats. I'm Deb Lawrence and I'm president of IPA USA. And with me on the porch today is Walter Drew. Dr. Drew is an author, visual artist and renowned researcher. He's presented hands-on play and art-making experiences designed to awaken curiosity, creativity, and to strengthen early childhood practice. I have known Dr. Drew for decades, and he is worth your time to listen to. So one of the things that Dr. Drew has been as part of his mission and the institute that he created is the Self-Active Education Institute. He and his wife, Kitty, founded this together in Boston in 1980. Dr. Drew has had an amazing career. He has been the president of the Association for the Study of Play. He's a facilitator for the NAEYC Policy and Practice Interest Forum, Play Policy and Practice Interest Forum. And he's currently a facilitator for the Florida chapter of the Association for the Education of Young Children. The other piece that Dr. Drew has contributed to children's play is his blocks, Dr. Drew's discovery blocks. I have these in my college classroom for students to play with. I had them in my early care and education programs when I was a director of early care and education. They are amazing blocks that inspire children to be creative and curious. Dr. Drew is a recipient of the 2009 Patricia Monahan Neurot Award and the Peace Education Award in 2018. With us on the porch is Carly Bedard. Carly has over 20 years of experience in the field of early childhood ed education. She's taught as a preschool teacher. She served as a program director. And Carly has provided training and coaching to the Orange County District and school teams for the past six years. She currently works as a program specialist with the Orange County Department of Education, supporting social emotional learning in the preschool through 12th grade classroom, such an important aspect. And is an adjunct instructor and I'm looking for where you're an adjunct instructor. So give me just one second as I get there. Um, let's see, where are you? At Biola University. Thank you for <laughs> filling welcome. that in. I lost my place. <laughs> no um, worries. So today, Carly and Walter are gonna share with us the essence of self-active play and why it's such an important element in helping teachers really ground themselves in play as well as talking about the play experience, which is what they do at conferences when we can go to them and are now doing virtually. So welcome, we're so glad to have you. How, how can we get started? Yeah. Well, let's see, uh, I have an idea. Oh, great, um, I love ideas. <laughs> this the person you mentioned a little while ago, Walter Drew is a friend of mine. And <laughs> <laughs> He's a friend of mine too. I think you're me, right? <laughs> For decades, decades. Yeah, friend of mine. Yeah. I'll see if I could find him. Maybe he'd like to say a few words today. <laughs> Good. Hi there. <laughs> Good morning or afternoon, wherever we are. Whatever time it is. It's time to play. 
in my life always play as a medium for uh, reconciling any differences that I have in my mind mm -hmm. or in relationships with other people, really play as a source of hope and optimism in my life personally. Mm -hmm. So I'm pleased to have uh, this opportunity to speak with you about the essence of self-active play, just a few words uh, to kind of look at more carefully. Self-active play. The self in self-active play refers really to the work of Friedrich Froebel. Mm -hmm. uh, his whole uh, way of thinking about early education and children was through the lens of I would say divinity, the spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. The self, therefore, is that unique, supremely beautiful inner being that we all have within us from birth on throughout our entire life. And the idea of self-active play is to activate that higher consciousness of the child, of the adult. In particular, the play experience itself that Deb referred to is, I think of it as a system okay. of education about play. Uh, the play experience really began a long, long time ago for me with NACI. Uh, for 27 years or so, I had the honor of presenting three hour sessions using an array of open-ended materials in both a solo play experience and a cooperative play experience, followed by other protocols, including journaling and discussion. But to the point about the essence of it, I think really the value of the play experience has to do with adults actually having that experience to rekindle a number of important considerations, not the least of which is their own play history. And that positive reflection is a way of rekindling an awareness and a deeper appreciation of what the child experiences. Now, if we do that with adults, the likelihood that they will appreciate I'm going to say four or five key elements in play. The first one is that in order to be present, in order to be mindful, the play experiences uses open-ended materials, which we typically now collect from business and industry. Although, as Deb said, Dr. Drew's blocks are excellent resources for you too. But business and industry have all kinds of fantastic materials. And we'll share information with you, with Deb later on that you can access, including videos of children and adults playing with these types of fabric and yarn and wood and wire, all sorts of things. But what happens in the experience of the adult, both in-person workshops and in our virtual experiences, virtual Zoom experiences that Carly and I have been doing this past year during COVID. We've done, I think, eight or nine or 10 or so. Um, but the point is, in both the in-person and the Zoom experiences, this is what happens. Instead of listening to someone speaking to you, instead of looking at an image on a projection, you have before you an array of resources, not unlike what a child might enjoy in clay, paint, or, or, or pay, play with paint. Um, and once in that space of physical contact, of fiddling, oh, you notice I was fiddling with a hammer the other day, and yeah. I smashed my finger, I was building I just noticed on this screen that I have a little black dot. Oh, maybe I should use that as a pointer. Oh, I'm not that good. No, just, anyway, let me continue without losing my train of thought. But I just wanted to explain about that finger in case you might not have noticed. It's a perfect round circle too. That's what's so interesting to me. I don't know how you did that. 
I, I love circles. Yeah. <laughs> behind me, this little circle is, is one I of my see. Yes, I and see. Yes. And those little uh, coconuts behind me. I'm oh. in my studio. But to continue, the first and most important thing is to be present, to be mindful. And it's not easy for children to be present and mindful if they're distracted by extraneous outer experiences and not have the inner experience to go along with it. Mm -hmm. So the trick in the play experience that we've been using now for three or four decades is to render the child or the adult present through their senses, mm -hmm. to engage in intentional creative purpose, to have an opportunity to remove themselves for a few minutes from the outer world and explore the inner world. And that's what Treibel was talking about. The divine essence of the child is expressed and experienced in self-active play. He wrote that way back, 1826, in one of his books. Now, when you do that, when you are free to be present without those disturbances in the mind, and you have a few moments just to go with the flow of your own consciousness. Something happens in that space. Your one-pointed presence, focused attention, leads automatically to the imagination, to wonderment, to experiencing new possibilities that you really hadn't considered before, because this whole play space you're now in is new to you. The materials are new and what happens with what you do with those materials connects you with a deeper part of yourself. Hands, heart, and mind become one. So when that happens, you have automatically inner realizations. It's pure from you and your experience. And those insights, those ideas, those feelings, those new awarenesses that arise spontaneously in your play have the power of being guiding forces in your life mm -hmm. that shape your thinking, that shape your behavior. If you're an early childhood educator, they shape your practice, they enrich it. Because what's going on internally is an expansion and elaboration, a richness of reasoning that allows you to really rekindle something powerful within yourself. And that connects to some of what Brian Sutton Smith talks about, mm -hmm. optimism through origination. In originating those forms, those simple little arrangements that you make with materials or paints or clay, allow you automatically to feel more powerful, more insightful, more positive. That's where the optimism bursts forth and you say, even though I have these restrictions in my school, even though I have limitations and barriers, I see a way of doing something that's really important. Yes, it is this way of encouraging the child to focus their attention, to be present within their own self, their whole spirit, and to allow them the time and the freedom to experience that energy. And then later on to share that in conversation and journaling and painting about that experience. That's the pureness of the storytelling that arises spontaneously in this form of self-active play. And Carly and I have discovered, much to our surprise, whereas before we thought only you could experience this in, in person, we now know from our own active research that these experiences can be had virtually in the virtual domain. Not long ago, one of our virtual experiences was with Champlain College in Vermont. Robin Plouffe and Deb Lawrence was present. And it's all of a sudden your heart is filled with this appreciation for what's going on 
with those students that are in the Zoom experience playing with material, just like children. So I'm okay. emphasizing the importance of the virtual yeah. as well as the in-person. And I think with that, I'm going to pause because we want to have this more conversational. Uh, well, I hope I didn't overstand my time. You did not. You did. That was perfect. Because I, I think when people say, well, what is the play experience or or what what is it that I would gain from that? I think the one of the pieces that I gained when I've done it several times is the memories of childhood that our children in classrooms across the US and world may not be getting because they don't have the freedom of being outside from you know seven o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon with my mom saying, go play and putting my lunch out on the on the back porch and saying, go play. And I drank out of the garden hose when I was thirsty. And I played for eight to nine hours a day with no adult supervision other than my mom occasionally looking out the window to see where I was. We don't allow children that freedom these days. And so I think when we can, and I worry that the generations that had those play experiences as children are fading because we're getting older. And, and so we have to almost revitalize some positive memories. So, and I think that's what this play experience does. It, it, it sort of makes you go, oh yeah, <laughs> I remember this. Carly, can you talk about how you got involved with Dr. Drew and how this, these play experiences have helped you transform perhaps the work that you're doing? Yeah, in absolutely. California? Yeah, I would love to. So um, I, I got involved with the work of Do Dr. Drew about five years ago when my manager, uh, Krista Murphy, who had been to some of Walter's okay. in-person sessions at NACI. And a board took member. Our, yes, yeah. and former NACI board member. She took our coaching team through a play experience. And at that time, I was a part-time coach. I was really passionate about play and constructivism uh, but hadn't experienced anything like the play experience before. And when she opened the doors and she had these amazing loose parts materials for us to engage with, it was love at first sight for the experience. I still remember these amazing rose gold caps that I got to interact with yes. and all of those principles and the essence that Walter was sharing I experienced firsthand as I'm sure you did Deb in your mm -hmm. first play experience. And I think it's that transformation of the experience and the realization of the connection to former play experiences for us who've had those mm -hmm. was incredibly powerful. I think for some folks, like you mentioned, Deb, now we have some participants in these workshops who have not had those amazing rich play experiences. And for some folks, it's a first time of experiencing true open-ended constructivist self-active play. Mm -hmm. um, but that for me, one of the things that stood out was just that incredible sense of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And like Walter said, when you remove those distractions that we're so often faced with as a teacher, even if you're playing in the classroom, which I did a lot because I'm a playful person, it's very different than when you're just playing for play's sake for yourself to connect with yourself, that inner spirit that Walter was talking about. So that experience really transformed my approach to professional learning as well, not just when it comes to play, because it's not enough for us just to talk about these philosophies or best practices, we've really got to make the space for adults and teachers to get to experience those things firsthand. And so it, that experience kind of helped me give meat and put words and like a actual experience to all the things I knew in my heart, I wanted to see in early childhood classrooms. 
Um, and so after doing that first experience, I had been doing some work with some teachers in Cambodia for about three or four years and they use the British national curriculum. So it is more of a play-based curriculum for their early childhood programs, but they have some leaders who are from uh, the States. And so even though I had done some trainings and workshops on the power of play and wanting to use hands-on experiences for the former three years, after I did the play experience myself, I uh, did a play experience for those teachers and leaders in Cambodia. And you could see that connection, the light bulb moments, mm -hmm. the reconnectedness with themselves, mm -hmm. the empathy that they have for children in that experience, that wonderment that Walter was talking about. Um, and in fact, I had a leader who said, you know, you've been coming for three years. You've been telling us how important hands-on learning is. And she said, I get it. After this, after experiencing it myself, feeling where I'm at in my brain, in my heart, seeing what the possibilities were, realizing that higher level thinking that I was actually doing and then connecting that. We know all learning is emotional learning, right? It's true for students. It's true for us as adults and experiential. So um, that's where I realized it wasn't just me being in love with this experience. It is a completely transformative experience. So I've had the incredible opportunity to provide the experience to educators in mm -hmm. Cambodia, India, did some work with teachers in Guatemala. And then here in California, Krista brought Dr. Drew out to help train our coaches, our quality rating improvement system coaches in the play experience. So we all had the opportunity to go through play coach certification directly with Walter and um, him and I just became kindred spirits uh, immediately. And um, about a year ago, when COVID first hit, I was had the opportunity to coach some educators. And I saw these teachers who I knew were passionate about play, who I knew were passionate about social emotional learning. And something about being in the pressure of COVID, only having you know 20 minutes with kids, some of them reverted right back to that rote memory and what color is this and what letter is this? And, um, and I know part of it is, you know, we're all just kind of doing the best we can. We sort of revert back to those um, initial practices that we may be used as educators. And so I felt really passionate about connecting with Walter because we couldn't do the, the play experiences in person. Right. Um, figuring out, will this work virtually? And the parallel process of having experienced the play experience and then transferring that to now imagining a new type of play experience. And like Walter said, we were really in that posture of wonderment and had pretty low expectations for the feeling of that play experience virtually. Cause as I'm sure you can attest to, it's such a powerful experience in person. Mm -hmm. But from the first virtual play experience, the energy that's able to be transcribed through the screen from these folks who are present, mindful, connecting with themselves and in that posture of wanting to connect with others through play, uh, it's been an incredible experience. And um, folks have shared just how powerful it's been, especially through this time, this chaotic time of living through, you know, the global trauma of the pandemic. And so it's been, yeah, incredible too. And I, I've got the opportunity to play with Walter who lives in Florida far more virtually than I would in person and the connections that it's created and the space that it's fostered for folks to connect with themselves has been just really incredible. So, well, and I think the power of the play experience, whether it's virtual or it's, um, it's in person, I think the power of the in person is that they have a, an extended amount of time that you can't really do as much as well virtually, but it is still powerful virtually. It's like the mini play experience is what I, I, I sort of describe it as, but it's what is more accessible to people who can't afford to go to the national conferences, can't afford to travel and, you know, with budgets being cut over and over and over again, it makes it 
much more much more vital that they have access to an introduction to, is what I call the play experience when we are doing it virtually. And I always encourage them, please go to it when it's back <laughs> in, in a real session because that will just deepen the prior knowledge that you had from the, the virtual one. But I think what teachers struggle with and administrators struggle with that I'd love to get some insight on in, from your perspective is what can we do to reset, you know, I, I'm getting ready to, uh, Mike Huber and I just wrote an article that I put in the Zoom thing on uh, what we learned from the pandemic. And and it, I, I think the next one on is we've lost our way, right? We, we're, we're so focused on the things that don't really matter. <laughs> you know, um, we certainly need to, assess children to ensure that we don't need to refer them to um, additional supports. But what we're doing is eliminating the opportunity that teachers have to build relationships with children because they're too busy filling out the stupid checklist. And, and we're so pressured to get them ready, which I hate that word, that that we're losing the essence of being allowing children to have self-active play. And so what wonderful words of advice can you give our viewers to take baby steps to begin to resolve some of these issues that I hear all the time? Well, the parents will be really mad at us or, um, the parents want us to do worksheets every day, or um, I have to do projects for art because parents want the cute things to put in their folder at home. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, is are we are we educating parents or are we educating children? <laughs> and what's important, right? What's most yep. important? So that's what that's my question. Um, you know, uh, we we may have slightly different perspectives, but. A couple of things come to mind. Uh, an experience I had, which relates back to what you were saying, Deb, um, about remembering being a child and bringing that awareness forward. It was probably 30 or so years ago in Rhode Island, where I was working in the Boston schools and region one Head Start program. And it was time for uh, an annual conference with the parents. So we had a parent education conference, Head Start Parent Education Conference in Rhode Island. And we were doing the experience that I would suggest as an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. That is, we were using the play experience itself as a medium for solving the problem that you just iterated the disconnect between what's really good practice, healthy human development, and what we tend to be doing, like worksheets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But what happened in that room, it was like a large, it was like a host room. It wasn't a big conference room. There were probably 20 or so parents sitting on the floor, playing with an array of materials. And over there in the corner, was a woman playing with blue foam pieces that I had gotten from one of the companies. You've probably seen those. I have those in my classroom. Yeah. Cool. So this lady, this was silent play, followed by cooperative play. But during that silent play, this woman began to cry. Wow. And, and all of a sudden, you know, obviously as a presenter, whether with a child or an adult, you immediately focus on what's going on. So mm -hmm. quietly, I walked over and I knelt down and I said, excuse me, I can't help but realize there's something upsetting you. Is there anything I can do? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and just said, I just had an experience playing that I didn't realize before. She said, I realized that when I was a little girl, my parents never played with me, never played with me. Tears are coming down her face, and you know I'm traumatized by that emotional expression. And then she says, bursting out, and everybody in the room is looking at what's going on. She said, 
what I realized in this play was I have three daughters um, and I never play with my children. If that's not an indicator of the power of this experience, a way of a work awakening new knowledge, whether you're a parent or a teacher or a director of a program or a politician, let us not overlook the power, not of the words, not of the images, but of the direct play experience as the force that awakens and nurtures, nurtures the teacher, nurtures the parent. And I, so think, I, that, say, yeah. I think that's a powerful story to begin with. I'm starting to cry. And then I wonder how virtually we could do that experience with parents. Because I know we're working in the early care and education programs and with anyone who's w willing to come on board, but that I, I, you know, I always do the play memories, you know, where did you play? How long did you play? Who told you what to do? Um, what adult told you when to change? What adult gave you the materials to play with? And people always go, well, none of that happened. I, I played with, I played. And maybe the older kids said, we're going to play this. And maybe that's what we did. But some of us would say, no, I want to play this. <laughs> and we played till the train whistle blew or the street lights came on yeah. or mom whistled out the back door. Mm -hmm. and, and and they and that begins to regenerate those memories mm -hmm. and bring them from the oh my god my cell phone is attached to my body and um, I'm working 14 hours a day versus eight hours a day because mm -hmm. I have to keep answering texts and cell phones so that's why I think the silent piece of the play experience is so powerful because it really makes you go deep mm -hmm. it, and it takes people a while yeah. in my classroom we can't do it for three hours though I would love to but in the classroom I bring all those loose parts out we put them on I put them on tables and I tell them you know choose the table that interests you and then we do the play experience for probably 20 or 25 minutes of our 55 minute time and and you know I don't tell them how long they're going to play I just you know I don't even pay attention to them because they're so self-conscious of well you know what am I supposed to do <laughs> is somebody watching me so you know I try to not even have my I have my back to them most of the time I'm doing other things and as music is playing and it's quiet mm -hmm. and that's what really gets them to go deeper mm -hmm. and then you know we reflect on it the next day and then the next the day after that we do partner play mm -hmm. and and so it it helps these young college students and I have a a mixed age group. I mean, they go from 18 to, you know, 60, but it, it helps the, the ones who didn't have that play begin to see the importance of that play. Mm -hmm. And it helps those that are older to regenerate those memories. So anyway, those are the, by helping parents do that, I think is is where we can stop the external pressure that people are feeling. And, and then the one other thing I want us to talk about, um, we've got like, we've got 10 minutes. <laughs> the one other thing I want us to talk about is how, oh boy, it just flew in and flew out, but it's really important. So give, give it a minute to fly back in. Um, how do we, how do we support teachers in understanding the the value of loose parts and not having the cookie cutter classrooms yeah. you know from the catalogs yeah. how can we mm -hmm. give them access to to ideas about where they don't have to spend their hard-earned little pay that they get to bring in loose parts and the I think I want us to stress the importance of those loose parts in inspiring creativity and curiosity and exploration. So can we talk about that for a few minutes? 
Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll um, kind of start and piggyback back off uh, Walter's response to your other question. Cause I think they both go hand in hand. I think again, providing these opportunities for educators, parents to experience it firsthand, the inspiration that folks gain from walking into a room rich with loose parts, I think Mm -hmm. is really transformative for a lot of people in reimagining what they provide as resources for the children that they're interacting with. Because again, they experience firsthand the difference of where they're connecting with themselves, where they're connecting with the materials, the inspiration that's provided by the open-ended nature and the imagination and creativity that's inspired by those loose parts. So I think as much as possible for directors to be providing this experience for educators and Deb, I love what you said. And Walter such an amazing advocate of this. Sometimes we can get a little bit wrote in the way we think need, we think things need to look. So all oh, the play experience needs to be three hours and it needs to go step one, step two, step three. So um, I love that idea of that inspiration you provided of, it reminds me of a quote by Arthur Ashe, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. If it's five minutes that grows into 10 minutes, that grows into 15 minutes, um, using those opportunities and continuing to revisit as a team, as a director, realizing that parallel process. If I want my teachers to be using loose parts and having these opportunities with their students, how am I also modeling that and creating time in our, as a team to engage? Well, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to let Walter share too about where yeah. to actually get these amazing loose parts from too, or some inspiration, but sorry, go ahead, Deb. What were you going to say? One more thing I want to say is if we could, it, You know, I think directors, I think teachers, they say, oh, I'd never be able to do that. (laughs) Oh, I couldn't do that. I have the schedule and I have to follow it. And so if directors could just say, you don't have to follow the schedule, except for lunch and outdoor time because of the playground limitations, right? If if directors could just say, and, and feel empowered to give teachers permission then I think that would be a change agent as well. They could be their own programs change agents if they would just be explicit about what it is teachers have power over. Because I feel like they, they feel like they just don't have power. And just imagine the leadership that we could grow if we empower teachers, but it has to come from the administration right? Because they feel restricted by whatever it is that's happening out there. So, you know, it's, yeah, change starts with it, with the leader. Yep. And again, then the experience, the self-active play experience really is that connection to self building self-awareness. And as a result, empowerment is a word that a lot of folks will share in reflections to the experience. So um, yeah, I, I mean, it has so many dimensions. I think that's what is the amazing part of the play experience. It has so many different dimensions. It helps. It, it's also healing. Right. And, and but it also helps people reconnect or recognize that they didn't have those experiences. But it also is empowering and 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 so reflective and really gets them to not just say children should be playing all day. And my, my idea of play is that I'll choose which children play in which center and which centers are open and will rotate every 10 minutes, right? Because sometimes that's people's idea of play versus having open-ended materials and freedom. That's a huge, important shift that I think comes from folks to, again, having experienced true self-active play, you'll get some folks, or at least I have in um, presentations, I'm sure you have too, Walter, that say, I thought I was letting my kids play. I thought I was letting the children in my classroom play, but it wasn't play. No, it wasn't play. So I think that that is another rich element 
of the experience. Mm -hmm. So Walter, where can they get these parts in our last five minutes? Uh, just uh, a couple of things before time passes so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I <laughs> want to take this opportunity to thank you very much, Deb, for oh. inviting, inviting Carly and inviting me to mm -hmm this form of play with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Oh, Carly, I'm but, privileged to yeah. have you. And I also want to thank Carly for being such an eloquent, truthful spokesperson and leader in the field of play mm -hmm. for joining with me both here today and those times past with the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Having said thank you, I wanted to mention a couple of things, if I may. Mm -hmm. One, with regards to all of the discussion, the emphasis is on the play experience being a universal tool. Mm -hmm. All cultures mm -hmm. would benefit from this format of allowing time for solo exploration, a universal tool, universal in its diversity of benefits we have been working in the field of, my daughter, Sarita Drew is a play coach. Mm -hmm. She works with abused and battered women mm -hmm. who have lost touch with their intuitive self. We're working here with Health First on families and children who are suffering from sudden traumatic loss. Mm -hmm. We're not only working with early childhood educators, we're also working with corporate leaders who wonder how to strengthen team building for directors of programs to have play as a medium to realize enormous potential for transcending differences, for abating the, the division that exists within the culture, within the community, within the family. Play as a medium, as you said, Deb, for healing. Mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Kiwanis International. The Kiwanis Foundation of Florida has just funded a part of our program to provide training with teachers and members of the Kiwanis community who often go into schools to read to children. Now we have an opportunity of helping them see how they can go into Head Start and other programs and play with children. So young children priority one is a key focus of Kiwanis. Um, and one last thing I wanted to, to be sure and mention, and that is with regards to your concern, Deb, with all of our concern, where do teachers get this stuff? Where, yeah. My feeling about it is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Our backyard, down across the street, around the corner from our businesses, it's a matter, as Carly used, the word developing awareness, self-awareness, and finding resources are everywhere. Corporations, yes, have. there's a whole national network now of reusable resource centers. We have that listed, Deb, I, I, I could send you that link. Yeah, send me that list and I'll stick it into the porch play yeah. chat. But we also need to work with our corporations to realize the very kinds of skills in the workforce that they're looking for. Yes. Just like the Heckman report is pointing out for years, ever since the Perry Project. Mm -hmm. We do it early on because what happens first influences what happens, what happens next. next. Yes, it does. That's early, you know. Let's yeah. get our businesses on board. Let's get our businesses to realize they want creativity, team builders. They want outside the box thinkers to be competitive in the global market. Where do you begin? In play, you learn the kind of basic skills to discover and to create, to nurture oneself and others. Anyway, it's almost time, I know, but thank you so much, Deb. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think uh, what, what Walter does and what Carly, when Carly and Walter do a virtual uh, play experience, I always post it on our face, on the IPA USA website. I post it on our Facebook page. So, you know, keep, be a friend on our Facebook page so that we can get you connected with the virtual play experience. And then hopefully in the future sometime, the in-person play experience. So 
Walter and Carly, I'm going to close this out, but don't go anywhere. Um, so for more information on Porch Play Chats or to join IPA USA, please visit our website at ipausa.org. And until next time, keep on playing. <laughs>